Well, hey, friends, glad you're watching our first official episode of Considering Charlotte. This is a series put together to try and help people inside and outside of the United Methodist Church to understand what is going on with the General Conference this coming April. They're going to be meeting for about two weeks at the end of the month, and there is a lot that has gone into it already. There is going to be a whole lot happening each day there, and before we got into any particular topics I thought it was appropriate just to focus on the actual process of General Conference. What goes into it? Um, how did they figure out what gets attention and what doesn't? Um, the, the whole intent of this episode is just to, you know, I, I, I've been reading about General Conference for two decades of my life. There's still so much shrouded in mystery for me, and it's, it's, it's hard to know what's going on. So uh, to its credit, the, Global Meth the, the <laughs> United Methodist Church has uh, live-streamed each plenary session for the last couple quadrennia. Uh, but even sh seeing what's going on there doesn't necessarily mean that you, you know what has come to the floor or why it's come or who, whose voice gets heard. And so hopefully this episode is going to answer for viewers how a lot of that works. That's the intention here. And so um, uh, last week we did an introductory episode to, to who we are, and I would urge you to go check that out if you can. Uh, it seems to me there's a good deal of uh, interest in these this series because uh, at this point over 1,300 people have listened to it or watched it, and uh, I believe that this is designed to be very helpful and include lots of different voices. Odell Horn is usually with us from North Georgia, but he's only going to be able to be with us every other week, which means that we needed to find another voice, and I'm very happy uh, to have Amy Valdez Barker with us today. If you don't know who she is, I'm going to read just a, a brief bio of her so that you know um, how, to, how to take her. I, I think we're really privileged to have her in this time. She's the Reverend Dr. Amy Valdez Barker. Uh, she has two decades of experience in religious education and church mission. She's the former executive director of Global Mission Connections at the General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. That's one of those top general agencies. Um, she was responsible for leading five regional offices and two global offices in leadership development and scholarships, as well as overseeing placements and supervision of 200-plus missionaries. Prior to that, she served as the Chief Connectional Ministries Officer for the Connectional Table of the United Methodist Church. She was responsible for coordinating the mission, ministries, and programs of the denomination. This, For those of you who don't know what the Connectional Table is, it is a hugely influential body of the United Methodist Church. So she she was high up. She knows exactly this whole territory that we're talking about. Um, where was I? Uh, in addition to her executive leadership roles, she has been a practitioner in the area of youth ministry education, strategic visioning, leadership development through church conference positions. She's taught courses at Candler, Garrett, Drew, Claremont, and through Be a Disciple and Online Learning Communities. So um, if it gets any more in the know about General Conference than this, I, I don't know what it looks like. Uh, currently, she's serving outside of the United Methodist Church in a, an ecumenical nonprofit called Congregation and Pastoral— well, no, it's called the Ministry Collaborative. She's in North Georgia as well, where Odell Horn is, so it's kind of cool that we get her to fill in uh, from the same region. So she's currently working with facilitators and ministry leaders— to connect with communities. So she's been all over the place. Um, I'll, I'll put an extended bio in the show notes for anyone who wants to, to know more about her and her academic interests. Um, but I, I've been talking long enough. I'm already tired of my own voice. Amy, so glad to have you with us today. And um, okay. all right, so Amy, I, I've given you an introduction. Um, last week, I introduced the other guys and gave them a chance to talk about what it is that they think that this could be, should be, what you're hoping uh, the impact of this will be. Could you just speak to that for a minute? Yes, um, I am born, bred, and likely will go to the grave as a United Methodist. Um, I absolutely love uh, the depth and the understanding of our theology. I love our connection. I love it for all of its um, good, bad, and ugly parts. <laughs> um, and so my hope is that through um, through my own experience and my own journey, um, I'd be able to bring voice to some of the things that I learned along the way about um, our denomination. But, you know, I think the greater gift is the greater Christian church and how we fit within that greater Christian church as United Methodists. So 
Um, general conference is the way, I think somebody put it last week, the sausage gets made. Um, and I think most of us enjoy the sausage most days. But, um, but yes, I want to bring voice to what I have learned, and I hope that it will be beneficial for those who are interested in continuing to lean into um, this process and this journey together. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So we are going to actually start with Joe because Joe served on the Commission on General Conference. Um, and so we thought it would be wise to, to have him explain to us kind of how that sausage gets made on the front end with that general commission that, that has coordinated all this. And just he'll, he'll set it up and then we'll turn to Lonnie and then we'll turn to Amy and, and then to Simon and all of you will together create a composite that uh, hopefully is helpful to our viewers. So, Joe, what do you think is helpful for people to know in trying to understand the general conference, uh, all that, that stuff involving that commission that you were able to serve on? So before the sausage gets made, the factory, I guess, has to be erected and, and uh, the workers have to be brought to it. So the, uh, the, the job of the, general, of the General Commission on the General Conference is to plan and implement or execute the General Conference. It's essentially like planning and putting together a giant uh, convention. And uh, the commission consists of uh, a number of elected members. I think it's 28, something like that, um, that are elected each every four years at General Conference. Well, when things are normal, and we normally have them every four years, we had a, um, a, a, a class is um, elected of laity and clergy, um, and then they are put on the commission, but they're elected to eight-year terms so that they're only graduating uh, some so that the others have the benefit of the experience of those who've at least planned one General Conference in the previous four years. The commission is responsible for everything from choosing the city and the locale, the convention center, um, determining the number of delegates, uh, the, the agenda, all kinds of things has to happen through the, through the general commission. Um, but the general commission works in tandem with the staff. So the general commission are the elected leaders. They're kind of like the board of directors or the board of trustees of a company or a nonprofit. They might meet several times a year to decide on general questions and policy, but the implementation of those decisions it goes to the staff. Of course, Gary Graves is full-time. He's the secretary of General Conference. You have other staff like Sarah Hotchkiss. And so the commission, for example, would decide on a venue. Then it would be up to the staff to negotiate the contracts and uh, work uh, with the local hotels to get uh, blocks of rooms reserved and work with vendors and so forth. So the uh, that, that's kind of how it functionally works. Um, the general commission now, I was on the General Commission for six years. I was elected in 2016 until I resigned in 2022. You don't need to go into the details of that. You can go back and look at the interview that Jeffrey did with me last March for my reasons. But um, the, the interesting thing about planning General Conference is that really it, the, the look ahead is eight years. So the, in 2020, they, they were already beginning to talk about where 2028 would be because 2024's locale at that point would have been would have been connected and usually again the typical pattern is that you begin the there's a site visit by the commission members to take a look at possible venues they make their decision so um, so now uh, as they're getting ready for 2024 they probably already made major decisions about 2028 um, and are looking even farther ahead than that so now, the commission members consist of people from all different perspectives, at least that was when I was on there, centrist and progressive and more traditionalist. So they have to kind of find a way to work together and, and agree on what the decisions will be. But they're not immune from, I think, the political pressures. And of course, the various members you know, certainly would favor things that they think would be helpful to the things that they believe in. Um, and I think it's what's interesting, perhaps, to come out to volunteer before we go to questions or comments is that all, a lot of seemingly arcane decisions get made. Procedural things have to be decided, which people's eyes tend to glaze over with when they think about. But these often can have an impact. So I'll give you an example. One of them is the number of delegates. So the discipline allows for a range of delegates. I think it's as low as 600 and as high as just under 1,000. And the General Commission makes that determination. How many delegates will there be? 
and then it would be up to the staff to then figure out how to apportion them. Well, the, the larger the number of delegates, the more representative of the varying sizes of membership of conference the general conference will be. The smaller the number tends to flatten out representation. It's sort of like the U.S. Congress versus the U.S. Senate, right? California and Texas each get two senators, even though they have huge populations. Delaware still gets two senators, even though they only have one representative. So the fewer the number of delegates, the more it looks like the Senate, the larger the number of delegates, the more it looks like the House. And there was a move when I was on the commission to lower the number of delegates. And the ostensible reason was it is expensive. The more delegates you have, the, the higher the cost. You have to house them, feed them, travel expenses, and all the rest. But, um, but it was interesting that it was the more progressive members that were pushing towards lower numbers and the more traditionalist members who were pushing for higher numbers because things like you know, Cote d'Ivoire would have a larger delegation with the larger numbers, a smaller delegation with the smaller numbers. So you see how sometimes these procedural things can actually have an impact on outcomes. Uh, I don't know if that's enough to get the ball rolling, if you want some more particulars, but... A little more texture to the uh, delegates in particular. I was reading an article from UM News this morning. Um, it looks like there's set to be 862 delegates this year, and right. it's going to be 55.9% from the United States, 32% of those delegates from Africa, 6% from the right. Philippines, and 4.6% from Europe. That's how it all got divided this time. And the Commission on General Conference was the body that figured out how that would all be apportioned? Yes and no. So uh, the, the numbers are based upon, this is one of the, the odd things about this General Conference. Because it was determined to be the 2020 General Conference postponed, rather than the 2024 General Conference, the apportionment of delegates was based upon, I believe it was 2016 membership numbers. And it would have, if it had been a regularly called 2024 General Conference, it would have been based on 2020 membership numbers. And you would have probably seen a smaller portion of U.S. and a larger portion of African delegates. Um, so, but yes, and the 862 member number was um, simply a carryover from the previous. That was the same in 2016. And in that little uh, description I gave of the argument about raising it or lowering it, we wound up compromising by just keeping the same number as before. But then they have to be apportioned out according to the, the membership uh, formulas. And, and yes, the staff works all those numbers out. You bet. So we, we're going to have all four people speak to different areas of expertise, but I, I think it's important for them to be responsive to each other. This isn't the four of them speaking to me. It's really the five of us speaking to an audience. And so um, Simon, Lonnie, Amy, anything, any texture to add to what Joe has, has said here or any uh, feedback as to what he's offered? I'm so sorry, Simon. I don't know what's going on with your audio, but let me let me read Simon's question, and and um, it has to do with representation at the general conference. He says the he's asking about the commission on general conference. Um, it, it seems pretty clear that um, business is going to go on as normal without about 12 percent of African delegates being represented uh, this year because of um, visa complications and travel to the USC. Uh, USA. This isn't a situation that African delegates caused, obviously. Is there any kind of redress whatsoever that the General uh, uh, Commission can offer? Or is this just going to have to be something that we shrug and say, well, I guess Africa is just not going to be represented as much as, as it should be? Sadly, my understanding is that at every general conference, there is a percentage of delegates who never get there or who have visa problems at the last minute or get sick or what have you. And I'm trying to remember the percentage they gave us. It was somewhere between 5 and 10% um, each time that don't make it. Um, I think they're, look, they're looking at 12%. It sounds high to me. And from what I'm here, what I've heard anyway, is that there have been delays in getting the, the uh, letters of invitation out to various African uh, delegations, which is making it even more difficult to get their visas because of wait times for interviews at the local consulate. And that actually was one of my complaints that led to my resignation two years ago almost, was that they had not followed up on that in a timely way. 
to allow for delegates to get enough lead time to get those interviews. I don't know that there is any redress for that. And that's, to me, uh, tragic. Okay. Well, maybe we'll talk more about that at a later occasion, but Lonnie's got some comments now. More of a question, actually, than a comment. Uh, as someone who's been uh, on the inside of the processes of general conference, but very much on the outside of the processes within the commission, uh, I, I've s sort of observed, I should say, uh, that there's a significant presence of the episcopacy uh, on that commission and I'm interested to know from your point of view as a real insider for time uh, for a long time there on the commission uh, how you judge uh, the influence of the bishops who participate in those processes how much does the uh, uh, council of bishops through those representatives uh, have on what the commission decides and does so there is a, a bishop is assigned to uh, participate or at least be present during the meetings and when I was on it it was Bishop Bickerton we were also we also had uh, Bishop um, I'm blanking on his name from the Philippines who sat in on those meetings as well um, they're supposed to really not interject themselves as that much um, but my own feeling is that they have a lot more influence than than they let on and then that and that they they perhaps ought to that's that's my impression uh, I can't quite prove it but um, of course when I do remember hearing Bishop Bickerton saying they didn't ever he did he tries not to say much but all the meetings I was in he participated fully okay well in the interest of time and we can come back to this this area of analysis if we want but I knew that Lonnie in particular is very experienced <laughs> in and uh, gifted with the legislative process. He's submitted a lot of legislation of his own. He helps other people to publish their own legislation, even if he doesn't agree with it. He, he just believes in the democratic process. And so Lonnie, perhaps you could speak uh, for a little bit about um, how it is that legislation is collected and submitted and sifted through and entertained on the floor of general conference. Sometimes uh, the legislative processes are uh, denigrated by those who think that uh, the general conference ought to be doing something other than legislating. Uh, but I think what we need to remember up front about general conference and legislation is that uh, b by our constitution in the United Methodist Church, the, the real task of the general conference is its legislative work. Uh, the general co conference is the only body of the church that has authority to legislate for the whole church. Uh, and there's no escaping that without its legislative responsibility, the truth is there wouldn't be any real reason for the General Conference to meet. That's what it does for the church. It produces the Book of Discipline and the Book of Resolutions once every four years. Hopefully, I mean, we've had difficulties with that since 2016, but nevertheless, that is the job of the General Conference is to do legislation. and. Uh, how, how that gets done is almost as important sometimes, it seems, as uh, what, the, what the result is, uh, process in this case matters. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a really open process uh, in the United Methodist Church, relative to many other uh, processes I know about, uh, for for uh, recommending legislation to the conference. It's called our petition process. Uh, any United Methodist individual or organization has authority to submit uh, proposed legislation in the form of a petition to the general conference. It's spelled out in our, our, um, our book of discipline clearly uh, that this is, this is open uh, for, for those who, who choose to, to work in that way. Uh, and Every petition that is submitted uh, is reviewed by, uh, formally, by the Secretary of the General Conference, but the Secretary can choose a petition secretary and has, for as long as I can remember, uh, done that. So that the real work of, of receiving and then processing initially the petition to make sure that they, they fit the required format, uh, is, that's done by the petition secretary. 
Um, and uh, she then uh, makes a, a decision about acceptability and those petitions that are found to be uh, ex uh, in proper format and otherwise acceptable uh, are then required to be published uh, so that all delegates will have equal access uh, to the material uh, in the in the petitions. Uh, this is done uh, through what we call the advanced edition of the Daily Christian Advocate. Uh, and uh, it's required that uh, the languages of the delegates uh, uh, are not a barrier to participation, which means that these petitions then have to be uh, translated into uh, all the languages uh, approved by the General Conference. And uh, the, the publication of this uh, is required to be done no less than 90 days prior to the opening session of the General Conference, which in the case of the upcoming General Conference will be uh, the 24th of this month. We're uh, at, the, at the door. This has been a co complicated process this time because of the multiple opportunities that people have had to submit petitions. Uh, in addition uh, to all those petitions that were submitted for the never held uh, 2020 General Conference. The ADCA, the, that's an abbreviation for the Advanced Edition of the Daily Christian Habit, the ADCA uh, was published in a timely fashion for that General Conference and all those petitions that were submitted through that process at that time are still pending before this General Conference and there will be a, an addendum to, supplement to, however you want to refer to it, uh, for all the petitions that have been received uh, then uh, at the other opportunities for submitting petitions. Uh, so delegates will have uh, all those petitions in published form uh, to review before they arrive uh, at uh, the General Conference. Uh, the process doesn't get any simpler after that. In fact, it only gets more complex uh, because each petition is assigned to a, a legislative committee. I think we have 13 this time uh, legislative committees uh, that will uh, have been assigned some number of petitions. Uh, and uh, each legislative committee by legislation that was published or was approved in uh, 2016, will have to be, uh, receive some kind of a recommendation or action within a legislative committee. Uh, and every petition that is approved by a legislative committee will have to receive attention, uh, some kind of action uh, in a plenary session then. Uh, so this is a lot of work. It's, uh, uh, again, as I say, can't emphasize this enough. The primary work of the General Conference is to deal with this uh, legislation. Uh, most of the legislation that gets uh, the most attention uh, comes, interestingly enough, in my observation, and I haven't uh, done a statistical study on this, comes from our general agencies uh, among the bodies that not only can but, uh, uh, but do submit lots of legislative proposals. Uh, our general agencies are very active legislatively. And, and this is, as it should be in my judgment, uh, that's one of the uh, functions, and Amy's going to talk about this more later, but uh, uh, is to, to help map the future of the church, and we do this uh, through our legislation. And so the general agencies do have an important role to play in this process. Uh, it's, it's also true uh, Although this is not set in any any sense as a formal priority, uh, it's also true that uh, bodies such as annual conferences uh, submit legislation. In fact, many annual conferences are quite active in the legislative uh, process for general conference. And so I, I know uh, that uh, when a, an annual conference submits a petition, it it's likely to get more attention than uh, a petition that an individual will submit. Although uh, it's, it's not unusual, having said that, uh, for a petition from an individual to get enough attention that it uh, becomes 
United Methodist law. I've been uh, fortunate to have some of my proposals become United Methodist law. Uh, so that's uh, the way that works. Simon and I were members together for a time of the Association of Annual Conference Lay Leaders. And the Annual Conference, uh, that, that body has also been uh, active legislatively. And, and uh, our petitions from, from that group have uh, received significant attention at General Conference. Um, the, the, the process in plenary uh, for dealing with uh, legislation uh, can be simple, can be complex, and one of the, the ways that we've come up with uh, trying to make it simpler is that petitions that are overwhelmingly supported or are overwhelmingly rejected normally are going to end up on what we call a consent calendar. That's an important part of general conference process. If we didn't have the consent calendar, we'd be there for months, not, not days. Uh, but uh, these uh, petitions that are by large consensus uh, slated, uh, destined to go one way or the other for approval or for disapproval will end up <clears throat> batched together and uh, not all in the same uh, consent calendar, but on various ones that we deal with through, through the general conference and are voted up or down uh, as a batch. Now, mind you, in uh, in experience here, a consent calendar is almost inevitably going to be voted by an overwhelming uh, vote of the general conference. There, there are going to be, uh, you know, maybe 50 votes out of the 862 uh, in opposition to any one consent calendar. And some of those are just going to be accidental votes, I suspect. But in any case, uh, that's the way the bulk of the of the legislation of general conference is passed uh, or rejected at any general conference all the 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 work that we see that in in th this is what joe called the sausage making uh, the, the the sausage making actually comes on those few petitions that aren't uh, overwhelmingly supported or rejected and that's where most of the time, the legislative time in the plenary will be spent, will be on these uh, petitions uh, on which there will be great uh, disagreement and much debate. So that's where the fun is, actually. So uh, that's what we look forward to. I think that's enough for an introduction for this, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. I'm sure there are a number of questions from you guys, so go ahead. Well, maybe just a few additional points. I think uh, you, know, you hear about the numbers of petitions, thousands of petitions that come in, and it's worth noting, I don't think you mentioned this, that a lot of them are repetitious. So especially on the, the more controversial ones, you might have dozens and dozens that say essentially the same thing. And so the legislative section to which it's assigned will typically pick one to then work with and perfect, as they say. Um, and then, as Lonnie said, every every petition has to be acted on, but the action can be to defer it to, you know, in, in cases of multiple versions of the same thing, just vote down 30 that are essentially the same and work on the one. So that kind of thing is also worth uh, just noting, I think. Can, can I also, can you hear me this time around? Yes. You sound great. Thank you. Can I uh, just throw a, a, a small question to Lonnie? How much influence does a legislative committee chairperson has on the prioritization of uh, of uh, 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 those petitions? Because they have a whole bunch of them. How do they determine which comes first in their legislative committee? And how much does the chairperson influence, how much influence does the chairperson have on that? Or does they have any influence on that? Is it fair to the committee or there is some kind of bias according to who is sitting in the chair? That's a really good question, Simon. Uh, and uh, the, the, the probably the, mo the most important critical thing that uh, any legislative committee is going to do is choose its officers. And that's true for exactly the reason that you point out. The chair 
uh, has a tremendous power in how the legislation is handled, uh, and uh, it, it's exercised in many different ways. The first way that the uh, chair is going to exercise uh, this kind of power is in uh, exercising his authority to name his or her, actually, you know, we've got to be inclusive here, uh, exercising the authority given to the chair to choose who serves on what subcommittees. And then it's the, it's the chair's responsibility to decide which legislation goes to which subcommittee. Uh, they usually do some categorization there. Uh, uh, this was dramatically revealed in 20, 2004 when Amy and I were both serving on the General Administration uh, Legislative Committee there, and uh, th we formed four legislative committees, and uh, it was a big uh, c committee, and virtually everybody in that room wanted to be on the structure subcommittee because that was the one that was going to deal with the issue of whether or not we were going to continue the General Council on Ministries and instead uh, replace it with something else, which turned out to be the connectional table. Well, fortunately, Amy and I were both assigned to the structure committee, and uh, uh, we worked that through and cooperated to um, recommend then that we replace the general commission on our, our general council on ministries with the connectional table, which Amy ended up leading eventually, which I thought was great for the church. Uh, but that was, a, that was a critical step in that process, was deciding who was going to serve on the structure uh, subcommittee uh, and send all that legislation dealing with that uh, to that uh, subcommittee. So, Simon, uh, your, your question is, is very revealing uh, and uh, points to what a, a critical step in the function of any legislative committee is going to be. And I want to echo what Lonnie was saying back to what you were saying, Simon, because um, if you come into general, con general conference new and you don't know these sort of inner workings and positioning, um, you're highly at a disadvantage, right? And so that's why the annual conference um, le groups really need to work together to update. I mean, so for example, with North Georgia, we had quite a few delegates who are new to the system and the process. And if you don't know these positionings and you don't know what you're walking into, you kind of walk into a legislative committee and you're like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll do whatever. But you don't recognize that, um, that there is a lot of positioning happening to both get somebody elected as the chair and officers and then also what com what legislative um, petitions are being dealt with by each committee. So if you're passionate about something, um, whatever it may be that the church and society groups dealing with or the annual conferences groups is dealing with, then being able to get on those legislative committees as well as spending a lot of time and energy, you know, knowing your legislative committee's um, petitions is so critical to the matter. And then having the relationships with the people who are on those legislative committees. So as, as people are preparing for this general conference, there are groups that are already meeting um, about the legislative committees, right? Like what legislations are coming to their particular committee. And there's a lot more communication, I think, happening because of the technology that we have available to us today. You know, since the pandemic, everybody learned how to use Zoom. So, so now these groups across the the world are taking time to to learn more about it and about each other. So my hope is that that's that's a benefit to the community as you're not walking into um, your legislative committee completely um, blind or unknown to who's around you. Well said. Let me summarize <clears throat> what I've heard for our audience, and then um, put one small thing to Lonnie, and then we'll we'll move on to Amy. Um, what I'm hearing from Amy in particular is that the better one knows the system, the better they can uh, contribute and participate whenever it comes time. So this is a, a huge reason why it's so important for delegates to be prepared before they show up rather than try and uh, run with the ball as soon as they get there. 
This is something that's been known for a long time by, by many, although some jurisdictions do it better than others. Uh, I would point our audience to an interview I did with Jerry Kula, who explained the formation of the Africa Initiative and how this was an explicit goal of the Africa Initiative just to help African delegates to understand what they were going to run into whenever they, they got off the, the, the plane in America to, to serve because it's not something that people magically know how to do. And, and that's part of why we're doing this particular uh, segment is to equip people who are going to be showing up, okay, you need to do some prep work and, and here's a little bit of that. And then you need to, to read the legislation. You need to know how to participate once you get there. Um, the, the particular thing I wanted to put to you, Lonnie, and I don't know if there's a way to answer it briefly, is um, it doesn't seem to me that all legislative committees rank equally whenever it comes to uh, airtime on the floor of general conference. It seems to me that there's been a priority placed first and foremost on the standing committee on central conference matters and that they, they get to decide what is the most important stuff. And then after that, there might be a ranking system. But um, my interest in watching the general conference is, okay, who exercises the most authority and then who's getting the, 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 the pickings afterwards, would I be right to have concluded that the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters is probably the most influential body determining what legislation comes to the floor of General Conference? Lonnie, you want to answer I'll, I'll give it a try, then, Amy, then I'd, I'd look for your help on this. Uh, it's certainly true that the influence uh, and uh, in, at least the informal authority of the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters has been growing. Uh, it's, I would almost call it mission creep. Uh, it, I, I believe it's become more powerful in that regard than it was initially it conceived to be. The formal authority for doing the kind of work that you've uh, uh, talked about there in establishing the, the flow of legislation and uh, that that way meaning priorities which comes first which which appears where uh, on the schedule is is the uh, committee on agenda and calendar they establish that that ranking uh, so that's that's where the real authority lies that the the thing is that the the power of the standing committee on central conference matters comes from is is the fact that it has a recommendation authority for any, any uh, proposal that deals with central conferences. So any other legislative committee that has a petition that has any implications for central conferences has to be not exactly referred to, but they have to have a recommendation from the uh, standing committee before they can proceed with it to, to the, the plenary session. So uh, that is definitely empowering for that uh, standing committee there. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. In addition to that, they are the only body who can put forth a petition directly to general conference on the fly. So they don't, they're the only body who doesn't have to go through all of the petition processes. They could at general conference put forth a brand new petition. So that does give them a different level of authority than any of the other petitions that Lonnie had described earlier. Part of, part well, of what I guess also, if I could throw in, would be that the um, what gets priority on the floor will also vary from conference to conference depending on what the pressing issues are. So back in 2014, the debate over what resulted in the connectional table, that had a much more central role then. And so what the hot issues are that they feel need to be resolved. I imagine this time, this coming time, the um, regionalization plan is going gonna, is gonna to be very much at front and center. So that legislative committee will have more, more airtime, you might say. And for our audience, we have two episodes slated to to talk about regionalization. So hopefully, we'll we'll help everybody kind of navigate those issues, and uh, so they can understand what's coming up on the floor of general conference better. At this time, um, so we've got two other areas of analysis coming. Amy is going to talk to us about the role and function of the general boards during general conference session and the lead up to it and following. And then, Simon, I wanted to speak to um, the role of uh, uh, caucus groups, since he represents the WCA in, in Africa, but also what the experience is like for non-American delegates coming to general conference. So 
uh, keep, stay with us because there's st- several more angles to look at this from. So, Amy, let's pivot to you at this point and uh, speak to your areas of expertise here. Yeah. So the general agencies, if you recall, are the actual elected bodies, the created bodies um, by general conference. So general conference is the only body who can create general agencies and who can also um, make general agencies go away, I guess, change the, (laughs) that's probably not something you should put on there, Jeffrey, but, um, but they uh, are also the one consolidate consolidate or um, (laughs) change the nature of the general agencies. So general agencies are elected by general conference, but their charges also come from general conference. So their purpose, their being, their um, their directive between general conferences are given by general conference and also created by their boards. So there is um, this complexity of responsibility by the general agencies between general conferences. So they have the directive that comes directly from general conference. They also have that in conversation with their general board, their board of directors who sit on there. But they're also in conversation with the connectional table in the programmatic work that they do. And of course, the work um, of GCFA, the General Council on Finance and Administration, as they have the resources to direct the work that they do. So there is, as Lonnie was saying, a majority of the petitions, I think last time I heard was like between 80 and 90 percent of the petitions do come from the general agencies. And it's coming from the general agencies by virtue of the responsibilities that was given to them in both their charter, but also in the previous general conference. So, for example, you know, um, the General Board of Church and Society did the work on the global social principles because it was given to them as a responsibility over that quadrennium to, to do that programmatic work. And out of that programmatic work, they then developed the petitions that General Conference deals with based upon the research and the listening sessions and all the things that they did that now ends up in the hands of General Conference. So it's kind of um, it's kind of an interesting matter because on the one hand, the general agencies create their work, and then on the other hand, um, they also respond to the work that was done, right? So it's um, it's a it's it's a balancing act, and um, and you know, and something that the wisdom of the Holy Spirit through the work of the general conference asked them to do. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's also difficult when you ask the general agencies to, to figure out what it looks like to structure themselves, right? Like, I think as Lonnie was pointing to, um, there have been multiple general conferences who have tried to deal with the structure of the denomination a multitude of times, because on the one hand, it's hard to, um, to structure yourself out <laughs> of a position when you also believe so much in the work that you're doing, right? Like we're the people who um, we hire for the general agencies, the people who get put on the boards of the general agencies are often very passionate about the work that they're doing, that they've been called to do. And so when you're passionate about something and you've seen that the, 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 um, that the church has said, yes, this is a passion that we want you to devote your time and energy to, then you're going to stay with it and stay at it and believe that that is the most important part of our being as, um, as a connectional system. So it's kind of a catch-22, you know. Um, I think the agencies have been, um, have been challenged to continue to think about, all right, well, what does it mean to sort of live within a structure that, um, that can be supported by the resources that we have as a denomination? And I think they've made good efforts um, themselves in trying to reduce, like, the number of board members while also trying to be um, cognizant and sensitive to the fact that we are, um, we continue to grow worldwide. So there's, it's a, it's, it's a dance, it's a tension that I think um, is part of this system 
that we have created as a United Methodist Church um, since the merger um, way back when. So yes, the agencies have um, a lot of petitions, but also we've created the system for them to be the ones who bring the primor primary petitions to general conference. Does that make, is that respond to what you were asking, Jeff? <laughs> Jeffrey? I, I think a lot of it, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to defer to you guys. Uh, any any texturing you want to add or questions you want to ask? Just an observation to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, second uh, Amy's authority for speaking in this realm. Uh, she's the only United Methodist I know who, uh, uh, well, as a background to what I'm going to say there, let me say that uh, our rule is that you can only serve 16 years in succession as a, a, a member of a board of a general agency, any uh, or combined. Uh, and Amy's the only United Methodist I know who maxed out on that 16 before she was 30 years old. Quite, <laughs> quite young. <laughs> So the, the thing I've been kind of years. curious about, oh, I'm sorry, Joe, I spoke over you. Go good. ahead, brother. I think there have been efforts over the years to consolidate some of the agencies, even to eliminate some of the agencies. There has often been a perception on the part of a lot of rank and file United Methodists that the agencies oftentimes are not quite in touch with their constituency. And that's been some, there's been some tensions there, I think. And I believe Lonnie has, has been involved in some of these consolidation proposals as well for the upcoming general conference. My, my thing that I wanted to ask was uh, during conference session, general conference session, are all of the general commissions, people all present and active and doing stuff behind the scenes, or is it a time for them to just kind of kick back and watch the council do its work, uh, or does it change from general commission to commission? Are some very active and some kind of sitting back? I, I really have no idea how many people are working behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, <laughs> um, a lot. The but let me just also kind of uh, give you an understanding of the the whole body. Like the general secretaries are sort of the CEOs of the agencies, right? When you think about it. Um, but not every general secretary gets voice and vote on the floor of general conference. In other words, they have to be elected through their own annual conference as a delegate to general conference to have sort of free voice and vote in on the floor of general conference. If they do get asked to sort of speak by the body of the general conference, then the general conference body has to give them voice onto um, into the into the group. So in legislative committees, I think that's a little bit more um, sort of free flowing because it's a smaller group. So for example, um, when I was the executive at the, the connectional table, I sat in on, you know, on the key pieces where our legislation was so that when, co when questions did arise, I could respond to those questions. Um, but I had to also get voice into that space. So the legislative committee had to give me a voice onto that space. I've had colleagues from the general secretary's table who did get elected to general conference and could then sort of speak on those matters without having to ask for per permission to speak on those matters. And they could give the textures to their legislation, right? Or to elements of those legisl legislative pieces and be able to sort of speak freely on on behalf of their experience to what the process was to get those petitions there. So in that matter, I think that general secretaries can have more influence when they come as a delegate. Same with um, staff members to general conference. If you're a staff member of an agency and you've been working with it for four years and you know that petition well, and you get elected as a delegate to general conference, then you too have a little bit more freedom to sort of speak to your experience of um, that process towards that petition. So, but behind the scenes, um, the, the agencies um, have the influence through their board members, right? So every agency has, you know, a variety of board members who are often delegates to general conference, but they also have it through just their relationships and their connections, right? So when people ask questions, they know who to go to and those agency 
um, staff members are usually there and available to speak to the different legislative pieces that they're following through. Perfect. Well, in transitioning to, to Simon now, uh, someone, so I'm not an expert on general conference, but I've, I've been watching for a long time. And one who is just now listening and hasn't been watching might get the impression from Amy that the general commissions and agencies are, are positioned to just get whatever they want and uh, bring whatever to be rubber stamped by the general uh, conference. And that is not what happens. Uh, sometimes it's what happens, but the general uh, 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 conference is not a rubber stamping entity they you have special interest groups caucuses just normal people unconnected to them delegates from all over the world that come in and they've done their research and there are many times whenever the connectional table or another general agency puts forward some legislation that is then voted down by the body um, and that that's happened quite a lot actually over the last couple decades while i've been watching so this is a, a body that as frustrating as it is with lots of policy and procedure um, actually seems to, to function quite well in representing the interests of the people despite large institutional pressure sometimes placed. Sometimes the institution gets its way, sometimes not. And while it's frustrating that people don't always get their way, it seems to me that, that it's actually worked the way that it's supposed to. And so Simon's been a part of uh, one uh, coalition group, the, the WCA, that has only recently come up in, in recent years. He's been a, a, a person who has been at general conference. He's seen the role of, um, say, um, good news in hosting special gatherings for delegates that are informational in nature. Uh, a lot of these special interest groups also play a role in educating delegates and determining uh, what the emphasis is on from uh, year to year. So, Simon, I wondered if you could speak uh, a little bit about the role that outside groups play in general conference, but also what it's like to attend general conference as a non-American delegate. Um, and, and take your time with this. I really want us to try and understand your perspective as you look at general conference. Uh, th thank you, Jeff. Uh, let me start by the last part that you, 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 you talked about. Uh, what we have experienced is uh, non-Americans attending general conference. Uh, yeah, it, it's not an easy uh, game. Uh, it's very taxing to begin with. Uh, it's very tiresome to fly for more than sometimes 22 hours. You have several connecting flights to get you to the venue of the general conference. So we get there very tired and immediately our diet changes. So you are trying to, 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 to uh, adjust in terms of uh, jet lag and uh, you also have to start working um, as soon as it's practical. So, so generally, international delegates will need some fair amount of rest and adjustment before they get into serious business. And naturally, the business of the general conference is carried out at, at a very fast pace uh, for my liking. It's very fast. So you have to adjust very quickly. And you got to be somehow acquainted with the uh, parliamentary language, which is sometimes very confusing. I personally had to acquire the, the Robert's book of, of, uh, of, of rules, you know, try to, to learn that. It, it's, it's not easy. Then on top of that, we are coming with hundreds of other languages other than English, French, and uh, you know all other so so we we need translation we we need all these things happening all at the same time so there are those things that uh, the general conference administration must always be sensitive about not that they haven't been but we always want to remind them that it's important change of diet is a serious thing because uh, quite a few delegates ended up in hospital uh, they could not cope with the diet and at the same time, you know, adjusting jet lag and all that, they end up their system upside down and they end up in clinics. So, so it's a serious thing uh, uh, from our perspective. Then, of course, uh, 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 to touch on delegates themselves. Okay, the other small problem on delegates. It's unfortunate that um, that's my personal assessment. Maybe my fellow Africans may have a different opinion. But I do, I'm not convinced that uh, my fellow uh, international uh, uh, delegates or 
or, or conferences have in, invested much or they've taken seriously in investing in their delegates. What I mean is, we seem to have a lot of new delegates every four years. You know, we have more than half of the delegates are new. Whereas I don't, I seem to see that from our counterparts in America, at least they make, they are intentional about investing in their delegates, such that a delegate, you may see them three, four times. And that kind of delegate, they are really powerful. They know the stuff, they've gone through the system. I think Amy mentioned that, that when you are new, it's really chaotic. You know, you are so confused. Sometimes you get lost where to get your legislative committee a room. It's a lot of new things that are happening and you are not very effective. So it makes sense for delegates to then be re-elected for the purpose of investing in them so that at least they become more uh, 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 productive and they, you know, they become more useful at the general conference. I'm really saying this to my uh, African counterparts and uh, fellow international delegates. It's very important. That brings me to the, to the issue uh, that we touched a little bit. I asked the question about um, chairpersons of legislative committees. Uh, as far as I know so far, we have not had a single African chairing a legislative committee. The best we have done is to have um, maybe vice chairpersons or secretaries, just a few. Not because we cannot or we don't want, but because the orientation has not been there and uh, many of our people are still new, so we then get disadvantaged in terms of uh, running for these posts to become, you know, chairpersons of legislative committees, which are very powerful in terms of influencing the priority of of those uh, uh, petitions that would then go to the to the plenary. That that's very we really get disadvantaged, and it then gets worsened by our multi languages that we then have, uh, you know, people then they kind of doubt whether they'll be able then to chair in French, then let everything get translated to everyone else in that room when the chair is person is a French speaking or a Portuguese speaking or Swahili speaking, things like that. So we, we continue to see ourselves kind of disadvantaged in those areas. And that's an area, thanks to Africa Initiative and some of our partners, they've really worked hard to, pre, to bring our, our delegates to speed in terms of understanding what is happening and for them to, 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 to contribute uh, more meaningfully to the debate on the on the plenary even in the legislative uh, uh, committees. So 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 that has been my experience in terms of being an international delegate. By the time you have now picked up, you fairly know what is happening. Unfortunately, when you go back home, the delegates slate changes. They vote for uh, another set of new delegates. So they go through that same cycle of confusion, and before they pick it up, they are changed again and. I would rather we would uh, really make a conscious decision to invest more in the delegates so that at least they know the system more and they can refer to the historical data of the general conferences which will help them make certain decisions or influence certain decision, decisions in the decision-making process of general conference. Uh, then let me just touch a little bit on caucus groups, uh, their duties and uh, you know their influence. Obviously, we all understand caucus groups. These are mostly unofficial caucus groups of the United Methodist Church. And their, their main duty is advocacy. That's what they are, they, are, they are there to do. And their advocacy has got a bias towards their interest group, the main agenda within that interest group. So that's why you see some are liberal linked, some are more conservative, but they are all caucus groups. And their particular agenda drives or informs what they really fight for when they come to general conference or even before during the time building up towards general conference they do a lot of canvassing a lot of advocacy for particular interest areas that they want i'll give examples uh, like um, last time in was it 2012 or 2016 when people were advocating for uh, the general church to to disinvest in uh, i think in our investments in uh, israel or, or out there because of certain issues there were very some very powerful caucus groups saying no let us disinvest because caterpillar is doing this and it is hitting negatively on our brand as a, as a denomination and things like that you know there were human rights issues there you know those those are advocacy groups so by the same token all advocacy groups has got certain interests that they want to to, to advance via the delegates so they want to send messages to delegates to try and connect and lobby and to garner as much support as they can 
for those interest areas so that they get the majority vote on the general conference floor. And I, I believe it's healthy that way because at least it will make us, uh, 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 it will get the delegates running, it will get us thinking and, you know, really getting to think seriously about these things because uh, we are trying to shape the direction of the denomination. So I, I think the, the caucus groups play a very important role in terms of, you know, shaping or influencing decisions at general conference. I will talk about the reform and the renewal groups that to which I belong. I belong to WCA, I belong to Africa Initiative, which is the only traditional uh, caucus in Africa, which has been standing uh, time tested and, you know, they, they've stood the test of time and they've brought a lot of positive results in terms of our perspective as Africans. So we, we have really been fighting to, to push our agenda is the, uh, more leaned on the conservative side of the debate. And uh, if you look at the traditional plan, for example, there is a lot of our contribution, a lot of our brains and things like that. So caucus groups aligned with that, they would really stand up and put influence and put, give information. And we want also fairness so that representation is fair. Information is getting to all those people fairly, openly, without intimidation, without bias. And we argue our way through. The same way on the opposite side, those who want certain areas to be pushed for, they do the same. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we are saying this is what you want to see the, the church doing, or we want to see the denomination going this direction, then we work it that way. So I, I, I believe they are, they are important, and we need to continue to respect them. As long as they toe their line and not, don't necessarily go into the dirty games of maybe bribes and other you know nasty and ugly stuff, Otherwise, if it is pure advocacy, why not? I think we need we need advocates. We need to, to talk. We need people to, to, to who can empty out and brainstorm with, and you know, end up influencing certain decisions. So I think for an introduction, that's what I can say for now. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that was a fantastic introduction, and I'm so glad we got your audio figured out so you could do that. Nobody here could have done anything close to that. Um, for Viewers, audience who are interested to learn more about the distinctly uh, African experience of General Conference and uh, the role of different caucus groups, uh, not just the Africa Initiative, but uh, the United Methodist Africa Forum is one, Africa Voices of Unity is another. Simon and I have, have had conversations. I've talked with uh, Jerry Kula, uh, Ande Emanuel. These are all things you can find on my channel. I'd like to think that they're useful for understanding more of that context. And it's, it's increasingly important right now. You'll see Mark Holland and uh, United Methodist, um, mainstream United Methodist UMC is, is increasingly concerned with developments in Africa. It, it really likes, looks like a lot of this stuff hinges on. And there is no way for everything to be perfect. But understanding that, is there a role for, for um, denominational leaders to play right now and in the coming weeks and months to guarantee to, to the best of their ability that the African voice is honored and heard and uh, not manipulated. This is this is where a big area of concern is, and uh, I'm not an expert in it, but it is something that I hope a lot of people have their their eye on. Um, that's all my response to Simon. The rest of you, anything else to to ask or add to what Simon has said? I think it's wonderful, Simon, that um, that that Africa is lifting their voices and ensuring that that there is equity in our um, the beauty of our worldwide church. I also value the fact that I think um, Philippine delegates are also taking the time to speak to the African delegates and vice versa. I think that there are, um, you know, um, often in our in our United Methodist Church, we've sort of centered in on, okay, the U.S. is sort of the mothership and then these other um, central conferences are out there. But I think what has been the gift is that because of technology and the the wonders of being able to travel, central conference delegates are talking to one another now, and I think that's um, that's critical, right? Like it, that voice needs to continue to rise, and central conference delegates need to be engaging with each other um, so that we recognize the gift of um, diversity within our denomination. So how, Simon, I would, I guess I'd love to hear from your voice, um, how has Africa Initiative and those other groups been reaching out to Europe, Europe um, Asia, and beyond um, 
for the for that kind of collaboration and conversation. Uh, thank you, Amy. We have been trying to reach out uh, mainly through uh, the, the, the social media and, you know, the Internet and things like that. But the, the biggest thing that we, we used to do is to have some pre-general conference sessions where we then invite uh, all delegates interested to then meet, uh, you know, delegates from Russia, delegates from the Philippines, all over. Then we would meet, you know, a couple of days before the, the, the beginning of the general conference. Whereupon we then, you know, you know, uh, network and lobby and and talk about, you know, areas of interest that we we seem to have common interest on. That's how we've been doing it uh, so far. But of course, we starting to meet certain challenges which we don't talk them about now. I guess that time will come when we talk of some of the, of the challenges that we are now getting. But at least that's how we have been trying to extend our tentacles to our friends all over uh, the denomination to try and work with us that way. Uh, at least before general conference, we would meet our American counterparts, our Filipinos, you know, all over. At least all those of the same interest groups we would meet and then exchange ideas and help each other, you know, so that we can march on together. So we say thanks to technology. It has really helped us to reach out to some of our friends out there. There's a hundred more things that we could talk about that are important and interesting. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to cut off for now. And then, of course, uh, anything that's, that's left off that's super important, we've got several more episode segments coming up where we can continue to add to the base of knowledge that we establish here. Uh, I just, on behalf of the audience that's tuned in, I just want to thank all four of you for making time to do this and share your expertise. Uh, it's just... Uh, a, a real great honor for me personally. I've, I've read about, you know, each of your names and initiatives that you've done over the years, and it's so fun to, to spend this time with you and learn from you in this time. Um, friends, if you've joined us on this, I hope you've been equally blessed, and I'm going to invite you, if you have additional feedback for any of the commentators or for me, uh, you can email me at plainspokenpod at gmail.com. I uh, want to urge you to share this with especially general conference delegates that, that you want to be fully equipped and in the know, uh, but also just people, whether they're inside or outside of the United Methodist Church, that want to understand a little bit more the dynamics at play and how the, the, the sausage gets made. Um, feel free to, to comment on this wherever you are and share it with people and, and like it. And I want you to go ahead and subscribe to, to Plain Spoken. Uh, we, we have s several more episodes coming up. The next one is going to, we're going to start off hot and heavy with um, human sexuality, but we're not going to do the, the debate or anything. We're not going to try and persuade anybody. We're mostly just going to try and understand the different proposals that are being submitted and um, the different theologies that are at play here. But, but we're not trying, the purpose of this whole series is not to argue, argue and turn up the heat. It's to, to add a lot more light than heat. So I hope you'll join us next week as, as we have Odell back with us and we do our best to have a well-rounded conversation that equips the, the lady and clergy for ministry. So um, thanks all four of you, Amy, Joe, Simon, and Lonnie. And uh, thank you audience for joining us and we'll see you next week.